Ouais, je m'en vais. Hello everyone, let's try that again. My, uh, welcome to the Academy for Eating Disorders webinar entitled Radically Open Dialectical Behavior Therapy with Allison Donovan and Sarah McLaren from Melrose Center. My name is Carmen Hansen, Manager of Community Outreach at Melrose Center and I'm your moderator today. Also with us is Don Gannon, AED's Deputy Executive Director. If you have any questions or concerns about this webinar, please feel free to reach out to Don directly at AED headquarters via email at dgannon at aedweb.org or by dialing 703-234-4125 in the US and by adding a plus one outside of the US. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. All participants Participants are muted with the exception of our presenters. The webinar is scheduled for approximately 60 minutes and is being recorded. It will be posted on the AED website shortly thereafter for AED members to download at their convenience, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We're about to begin the presentation, after which we'll answer your questions from the audience. Please feel free to submit your questions to us during the presentation using the chat box a chat text box on the bottom middle of your screen, and then I will share them when, when the question portion of the webinar begins. Let's begin by introducing our speakers. Allison Donovan is a licensed psychologist who graduated from the Minnesota School of Professional Psychology in 2012 with her doctorate of psychology and has worked in the field of eating disorders since 2014. She is currently a therapist in the inpatient, residential, and partial hospitalization programs at the Melrose Center for Eating Disorders in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Sarah McLaren has been a licensed marriage and family therapist since 2015 and has been working in the field of eating disorders, both, both as a therapist and a mental health practitioner for six years in both adolescent re residential and outpatient settings. She is certified as a family-based therapist working with adolescents who have eating disorders and their families. She has been trained in RODBT and currently practices as an outpatient therapist at the Melrose Center. So without further ado, Allison and um, Sarah will start. All right, hi everybody, I'm Allison. Hello, I'm Sarah McLaren, um, and we're going to be talking to you today about RODBT and eating disorders. Um, we're going to give an overview of uh, just some general things about RODBT and how it differs from traditional DBT and also how we integrate it with our practice in eating disorders. Um, so yeah, I guess Sarah. Yeah. We'll start. I'll start. So what is RODBT? RODBT um, was created um, just a few decades ago by Dr. Thomas Lynch and his team um, in the UK. Um, and it was uh, designed for patients who were not um, improving from traditional models such as DBT um, and other treatment models. So um, the theory looks at um, patients who are experiencing what's known as over control and we'll explain that shortly. Um, and it looks at um, markers for psychological health and this being things of reciprocity and openness, flexible control um, and intimacy and connectedness and how they interplay with um, developing um, skills, relationships um, and just overall health and wellness. So when we think about optimal control over control and under control, RODBT um, talks about these different things and how they interplay with psychological wellness. So this bell curve is created um, and identifies that individuals that experience what's known as over control have, um, can really benefit from a RODBT um, treatment model in which um, they have kind of higher constraints 
um, or they kind of internalize when faced with challenges in their life. Um, and so these can manifest in lots of different ways and we see them in different clients. Many times for us, we see it through eating disorders or depression and heightened anxiety. Um, and individuals that experience um, more extreme forms of under control, it manifests for them in other ways. But for the majority of the population, they're able to kind of assess their environment and their surroundings and be able to engage um, through optimal control, through kind of assessing, you know, what do I need socially, behaviorally, in order to support me um, in this moment? And so many of us are kind of in that in-between place of, you know, what is going to be most helpful for me to manage these challenges that I'm experiencing. So, all right. So uh, a little bit more about under control and over control. Um, under controlled people are um, who the people that we think benefit most from traditional DBT. So they tend to be more externalizing, more impulsive and dramatic. Um, they tend to be more emotionally expressive as children, uh, more likely to develop externalizing disorders, high sensitivity to reward, low detail focus processing, and low inhibitory control. So if we go down that list, we can see those are a lot of the things that traditional DBT uh, does address. You know, how do you have uh, take big emotions and make them smaller, contain them, um, you know, resist your impulses, uh, regulate your emotions, etc. Um, over controls are in a lot of ways the opposite of that. Um, they're more emotionally constricted, risk averse, socially anxious. They tend to develop more internalizing disorders, such as eating disorders, such as de uh, depression, um, and are more sensitive to threat. Um, so, you know, traditional DBT is a lot of times where these people had been sent for treatment in the past, um, but, you know, while they would be very good DBT students and do all their homework on time and participate, um, they weren't really benefiting from it, uh, and the theory is that um, that it just wasn't addressing the, the core reasons why they had developed the disorder and what was um, causing the disorder to continue. Um, so over controls uh, have four core deficits, reciprocity and openness. Um, they have trouble, um, you know, uh, engaging with other people, being open, being intimate, uh, flexible responding, being able to assess a situation and respond accordingly, um, emotional expression and awareness and social connectedness and intimacy. So this is what RODBT addresses are these four core deficits. And so then we look at, you know, one of the ways is looking at how RODBT may be different and also similar to traditional DBT. So we look at some of the behavioral principles and dialectical philosophy between the two. So for individuals who are um, experience more under controlled tendencies. Um, they may experience more uh, cluster B or dr dramatic erotic type of personality styles. So these clients um, may experience more like um, a borderline or antisocial anti excuse me, personality disorders. Um, but for individuals that have more over controlled um, tendencies, uh, clusters such as A and C um, can can manifest. So these can be avoidant, obsessive compulsive, um, schizoid personality disorders, um, paranoid personality disorders, um, but also things like chronic depression, anxiety, um, and um, anorexia nervosa and other elements of eating disorders as well. Um, and so kind of when we look at those two, similar to what Allison was saying, so for individuals that would really benefit from DBT is that kind of heightened emotion expression where it's more outward um, and RO is when we're looking at more of that internalization where they're managing some of those um, those challenges internally. So DBT, um, we look at there tends to be a little bit more anxious attachment styles in their relationships. So they may seek attachment with their therapist or support network uh, more read readily. So there's fears of maybe um, abandonment or ruptures in relationships. And so some of those core problems that we oftentimes work with patients in those populations are looking at emotional regulation and impulse control. Whereas a client that could benefit from RODBT is they may experience more avoidant attachment styles. So they have difficulty attaching 
um, or difficulty reaching out for support, whether that's from a therapist, family members, or peers, um, and difficulty kind of increasing those various intimacy levels, um, especially when there's conflict. So they tend to be a little bit more avoidant. And so core problems that when we're working with those types of clients, it can be, you know, how do we work on social signaling, um, increasing openness and flexibility, um, and you know, when there's challenges in those two areas, sometimes a client can come across as maybe aloof um, or um, just difficulty with that connectedness. Um, you know, and so sometimes that, you know, some of those kind of core messages for clients in DBT is, you know, how do we help support motivation? How do we help kind of building up some of those skill sets, whereas clients who are experiencing over-controlled perfectionism and, and people-pleasing is already kind of an element that they're really good at. And so it's more of, it's not about performing better, trying harder, it's more about how do we decrease rigidity, increase flexibility, um, and recognize that, you know, it's not about fairness, it's not about um, things being perfect or the best, but how do we just kind of roll with it um, so that there's that element of just being okay with that variable of change. Right, being more flexible is a big theme throughout our DBT. That's kind of the whole goal of it, if you had to uh, you know, put it in a nutshell. Yeah, absolutely. Looking at you know, how do we embrace spontaneity? How do we celebrate it? Um, Be less self-conscious in self -conscious. social situations. Yeah, and so one of the elements too with RO is that we may do an activity where we practice and celebrate doing something spontaneous and then not process it afterwards, move on with the lesson. And that can be a way to, you know, not really pick apart it and also help deconstruct some of that rumination that could occur for some of these patients. So one thing that I want to loop back a little bit um, to what I should have talked about when I was talking more about um, you know, just the different general differences between under control and over control is that all of us can probably categorize ourselves as one or the other. You know, there are very few people that I have met that I've asked, do you think you're under controlled or over controlled? He healthy people um, that are unable to identify themselves. Um, for example, I am have a very natural over control tendency and I think you're under control. I'm yeah. under control. Okay. Yeah, it's it would be pretty much everyone's going to fall somewhere at least 51, you know, 49, right? Nobody's 50, 50. Everybody's going to have some tendency, you know, because it's a form of coping, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're going to have a preferred form of coping style to, to manage some of those challenges. Right. And so we, we all fall pretty much one, um, one or the other. Um, but you know, what we're talking about is, uh, like, pathological over control where you you can't be flexible in a given situation. So, you know, again, even though I am over controlled, um, I'm able to do this presentation, I'm able to make facial expressions um, and, and act more under controlled in the situation and flexibly respond. Um, um, whereas, you know, what we want to treat with RODBT is um, someone who isn't able to do that. So that was just a little side note that I wanted to go yeah. into. <laughs> and even though I have more of an under control tendency, I'm not going to be emotionally dysregulated about it. Um, and, you know, tantruming like, ah, this is so <laughs> stressful, you know, like it, it, it's being able to, you know, assess where am I at? What do I need? And, and what are ways to regulate myself in various right. situations. Right. So if you are, you know, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, you know, oh my God, I'm over controlled or I'm under controlled, um, you probably lie in that healthy middle where you're able to, you know, come pull yourself into Manage, the middle yeah. when it, when it uh, makes sense to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, one thing that we get asked a lot is about suicide and self-harm. Um, uh, one of the reasons for that is that a um, you know, traditionally, people who have engaged in self-harm um, and had suicidal ideation have been referred to DBT. Um, you know, the idea is that they um, have, can trouble, have trouble controlling their impulses around that, et cetera. Um, so we're finding that to not be so, and that um, people who are under-controlled and over-controlled um, struggle with uh, suicidal ideation and self-harm. Um, he, so here's the way that it looks different. Um, with somebody who's under-controlled, um, they engage in self-harm and suicide at high rates, as do people who are over-controlled. Um, but theirs is usually mood-dependent and unplanned. 
um, they tend to be the uh, people who tell you they have no idea um, how it happened. You know, it just, it just happened that, you know, they have more trouble uh, discussing what led up to it, you know, the thoughts, the feelings, et cetera, like, nope, I had the thought and it just happened. Um, also, they don't uh, tend to try to keep their self-harming behavior a secret. Um, you know, we, we think about this maybe most traditionally with our patients who have borderline personality disorder and want us um, to see their self-harm as a, um, you know, to, to try to physically tell us how much they're in distress and how much they're struggling. Mm -hmm. um, and again, just kind of repeat, uh, it tends to be mood dependent and impulsive. Um, Overcontrolled uh, people tend to engage in self-harm and suicide at high rates as well. Um, but theirs is usually planned. Um, you know, it, it's not, not impulsive. Um, you know, they've been thinking about it for a while. They've planned out when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it. Um, part of that is um, because they want to keep it a secret for the most part. They don't want you to know that they're doing it. So they, again, it, it, it must be planned well in advance in order to kind of keep it a secret and hide it. Um, their self-harm and or suicidal behavior is more likely to be rule governed rather than mood governed. Um, the example on here is to restore their faith in a just world by punishing themselves for perceived wrongs. So, um, you know, they're much more likely to self-harm when they feel like they have broken one of their personal rules. All right, so difference in the therapeutic stance of DBT and RODBT. So DBT uh, therapist uses external contingencies, including mild aversives, takes a direct stance in order to stop dangerous impulsive behavior. So in DBT, there, there are a lot of rules that are imposed and a lot of expectations and um, again, a lot of uh, behaviorism and external contingencies. Mm -hmm. um, with RODBT, um, the therapist is less directive, encourages independence of action and opinion and emphasizes self-inquiry and self-discovery. So the therapist in this case isn't going to be, isn't going to tell you what to do. Um, and one of the reasons is simply our over-controlled patients want to be told what to do. Um, they, they're very anxious about doing the wrong thing and they don't trust themselves often to make decisions. So the therapy is more about um, helping them to be less anxious about their decisions and to trust themselves. Um, and you can't do that if you have a lot of, um, if you're very directive. So the primary therapeutic focus when we think about when we're approaching our under controlled clients is looking at how do we help support kind of when we look back at that bell curve, how do we help kind of move them more towards the middle of the bell curve. So kind of managing some of that externalization and pulling it in to be more internal. So looking at emotional regulation skills, gaining um, more control over some of that behavioral elements and a lot of kind of focus on distress tolerance. Whereas for our over-controlled clients, the RODBT skills look at taking that internalization and practicing more externalization in order to help pulling towards the middle. So focusing on social signaling, practicing more openness, you know, looking at, you know, if we're experiencing a sense of threat, how do we get to a, a place of signal, not only signaling openness, but sensing openness, feeling open, so that we feel more comfortable sharing, letting people know where we're at in order to enhance intimacy, which supports that social connectedness skills with our relationships. Yeah, I always think about, um, you know, in DBT, you're taking something big and trying to make it smaller. And in yeah. RODBT, you're taking somebody who's very, kind of made themselves very small and trying to try to get them to make themselves bigger. Yeah. And, and sometimes we'll do those, those types of things in groups too, where we'll have the group stand up and do some, some activities where we're actually kind of doing a little bit more movement um, in order to help support some of that and do it as, as a group where it creates that social connectedness together um, and then move forward from that with minimal processing in order to um, help decrease any kind of rumination, which supports that, in, you know, rumination supports internalization. Um, you know, and so looking at kind of what the therapist teaches for clients that are under controlled, you know, how do we kind of avoid uh, conflict, strategies for organization, um, managing and restraining impulses, um, you know, so um, those can be things like the cope ahead skills, um, delayed gratification, um, and distress tolerance, absolutely. Um, 
And the reality is, is these are types of things that individuals that experience over control come very naturally. Right. They're them. already very good at it. They don't need more practice. They're at very it. <laughs> good at it. And and so when they're when they're doing some of those skills already, they're like, Ooh, I got it. I got mm -hmm. it. You know, and, and so they're they're just like, how do I do it better? Do it better. And you know, for, for many clients that are over control, it's just like too much of a good thing. I'm just gonna add more control. Um, mm -hmm. and so the goal is to deconstruct that a little bit for them. And so increasing that openness, flexible responding enhancing that social connectedness in order to support their social network and their support network, and then practicing more vulnerable expression of their emotions and thoughts. All right, so how does all of this relate to eating disorders? Um, so people who are under controlled or over controlled experience eating disorders. Um, you know, I know that we see people all across the spectrum of control, both in inpatient and outpatient settings here. Um, and either over or under controlled can experience a variety of eating disorder symptoms. Um, you can't tell um, just based on somebody's eating disorder diagnosis whether they are over controlled and under controlled. Um, you know, I, we certainly have people who are very over controlled who uh, binge and purge, which I think if we were just kind of, you know, thinking about it, we might think, oh, that would be a more under controlled thing. It would be, you know, that seems more impulsive. Um, you have to look at the intention behind the behavior. So if we just take the, the binging and purging symptom, um, you know, you can certainly have people who are under controlled, who are very impulsive, who binge and purge. And again, just as with the self-harm, you know, they're the ones who will tell you, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I had, you know, I had no idea. I thought it, things were going okay. And then all of a sudden I did it and I don't know why. Um, Over-controlled clients binge and purge as well, but their, uh, their behavior is much more likely to be planned. You know, they'll be thinking about it the entire day with the intention of doing it. They'll know where they're gonna go, what they're gonna get. Um, and they will um, make sure that it is in secret and, um, you know, binge and purge away from other people um, so that they're able to, they're able to hide it. So yeah, you really have to look at the intention um, and, it, you know, that can go for any eating disorder mm -hmm. symptom as well. You know, it could be um, somebody who's under controlled, it could be somebody who's over controlled. So you have to dig deeper to find out uh, which, you know, which side of the, um, spectrum that they're on. So over-controlled, uh, planning, planning, secrecy, um, you know, et cetera, under-controlled, more impulsive. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, different diagnoses um, that can give you a clue uh, to whether somebody's under-controlled or over-controlled are on this page. Um, I'll just run down them real quick. Um, under controlled diagnoses tend to be more borderline personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder. Do you see a theme here about personality <laughs> disorders? Um, binge and purge eating disorders. Again, um, a lot of times that's not necessarily 100%. Mm -hmm. um, bipolar disorder, conduct disorders, and externalizing disorders of any kind. Um, Overcontrolled uh, individuals tend to struggle more with obsessive compulsive disorder. They tend to have more, uh, be more diagnosed with paranoid avoidant or schizoid personality disorders. Anorexia nervosa, again, it's more common to be overcontrolled. Somebody certainly could be under controlled. Um, chronic depression, autism spectrum disorder, treatment resistant anxiety, and internalizing disorders. So, Again, this isn't, you know, there isn't 100% in either category, but um, the disorders just tend to fall along those lines. All right, so um, in addition to the distinction between under control and over control, there are two distinct subtypes um, within over control. And I think, um, you know, this can, if, if you're not aware of this, it can be difficult to identify some people who are over controlled because these two subtypes can look very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, over And we all have clients like these. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you, I'm sure you guys will all be able to think of someone. So the overly disagreeable subtype. These people um, put the priority on being right over being liked. They do not 
care a lot about you liking them. They might care a little, but if it's a choice for them between being right in the situation and being liked by people, they will always choose being right. Um, they can be pro-social, but are willing to be unfriendly in order to achieve an objective, even if it damages the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to have more flat or inhibited emotional expressions when under stress. Um, they may see themselves as a loner and they have a tough exterior, um, but typically are pretty insecure and anxious underneath, but they will not show that if at all humanly possible, they will do anything to not. So, um, you know, these are the types of clients that you'll have in session that uh, will, you know, you'll give suggestions and you'll give suggestions and they'll say, no, 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 that's not going to work. That's not going to work. Um, and they don't care if you don't like that. <laughs> um, they tend to be the patients that we think of as more of our difficult patients. Um, overly agreeable, um, they're just the opposite. They are motivated to be seen, uh, to be liked uh, versus being right. They will agree even if they know that they're right in a situation because they want to be liked. They're motivated to be seen as competent and socially acceptable. Um, however, this can be pretty exhausting um, because they always have to be on. They always feel like they're performing. Um, they uh, will often display disingenuous or incongruent expressions to their actual emotion. Uh, so somebody who's in a lot of distress but is smiling through it, uh, which can be, uh, you know, if, if you've been, uh, in, if you interacted with somebody like that, which I'm sure you guys all have, um, it can be kind of disconcerting. You know, they're the ones who are going to be telling you about the most horrible thing that's happened to them in their life and be smiling throughout it. Um, and they oftentimes, or most of the time, aren't even aware that they're doing that. They have no idea that it's incongruent. Um, they display pro-social behavior, um, and it appears intimacy enhancing, yet they fear personal disclosure. Uh, this, this is the person who uh, has a lot of friends, but if you ask their friends, they might say they don't really know a lot about the person. You know, they'll say they're a great listener, um, they're easy to disclose information to, but they are the person who rarely discloses personal things about themselves. They like to keep it on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and these uh, patients or clients might work hard to convince their therapist that they are fine or okay. Um, again, even even when there's evidence to the contrary, you know, you'll see, um, since I work in inpatient, I see people who have been admitted to the hospital for their eating disorder. And, you know, I think uh, that's a pretty good indicator that things are not fine, but some, you know, the overly agreeable subtype, you know, you'll see them for the first time and ask them how things are going and they'll say, oh, things are going fine. Um, things are going good. Um, they're also the client that when you suggest things to them in session, things that they might do that might be helpful, they will, they'll agree with you. They'll say, yep, that sounds like it would be very helpful. Yep, I'm going to do that. Um, but they have no intention of actually doing it. Uh, they just don't want to upset you. They want to be liked by you. So they want to be seen as the compliant patient. So then when we look at you know, social signaling and how this element plays into um, RO um, and how it, it helps supports um, clients. Over control um, individuals or individuals that experience over control experience challenges with loneliness and detachment in their relationships. And so, and, and many of that is, is just by default, um, their experience with coping is just their threat sensitive um, or activation for threat is just easier um, than individuals that are more in that, in that inner part of the bell curve um, or individuals who are under controlled. So um, because of this, they do experience kind of that fight or flight mode much more easily. It's easily activated rather than that sense of um, what's known as novel um, or sense of safety or reward. Those, those areas um, are not as easily activated for them. Um, and so, and since we're constantly scanning our environment for feeling safe and just kind of assessing, um, you know, for an individual who is over controlled, that, that threat sensitive is more easily activated. Right. They're going to find threat everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And so then when we think about the sympathetic nervous system, um, 
its activation causes body tension and inhibit it and it inhibits social signaling right um, and so you know when we're feeling um, you know so RO talks about five different kind of social uh, brain signals you know and so when we're kind of scanning the environment so social safety we tend to be more relaxed um, you know much more of like a melody when we're speaking um, kind of ease of breathing when there's novel there's kind of you know kind of assessing the situation of oh is there is this something i want to approach or is there a threat reward there is a degree of kind of you know dampening of kind of what's going on but we tend to have much more you know expressive um, emotions um, and body language during that time and threat definitely is much more reserved much more closed um, and inhibited social signaling because at that time you know from kind of an evolutionary standpoint it's you know taking care of and being closed and take, you know making sure that we're safe and then that last one is overwhelmed where the system just needs to kind of shut down and reboot and that happens oftentimes when either reward or threat becomes too overwhelming for the body you know so that can become a problem if if threat is consistently activated that you know our channels of expression such as body language and facial expression you know that's a big part of how we form bonds how we communicate with each other um, and so part of what RO talks about is how do we help support a sense of safety and openness in those various forms of channels of communication to help support these individuals. And one of those is a skill called the big three plus one. Um, and so it's looking at how do we use body language to help support kind of the parasympathetic ner nervous system in order to signal social connectedness because it's happening so fast um, you know, faster than language that, um, you know, we're just, we start signaling back and forth that if I can kind of move my body language, my body into a, a, a position of openness, um, it starts signaling to the other person, you know, I'm open, I'm relaxed, um, that they will start signaling it back to me and it creates this kind of um, cyclic thing. So th that big three plus one is kind of if you're sitting leaning back in your chair, taking kind of a low deep breath, um, like a half, a half smile or close smile, and lifting the eyebrows. And that lifting the eyebrows, um, and here there's a picture here too. Oh. Here, um, that lifting the eyebrows engages um, the various muscles, just the very minor muscles here around the eyes um, and the lips, and it just it, it shows interest, engagement, and um, and it's slightly different than than that DVT half smile, right? Right. Yeah, the the eyebrows up kind of just opens up the face, and as an over control, um, this skill really speaks to me uh, because you know, when I am anxious, when I am, when my threat system is activated, my face definitely goes blank. Um, and it is hard to make genuine facial expressions at that point. And so that is something that I've had to practice a lot. And the big three plus one skill is really helpful in that. So, you know, being able to actually just relax and make facial expressions, um, you know, so you can connect with other people because it's really hard to connect with a person who's just completely flat. Yeah, and we do. We look. We look at how those that genuine kind of interest and genuine smile, even if it's just that really gentle, just kind of like, you know, it it has a a degree of warmth and openness um, that is conveyed to the other person. That is very different than just the kind of, you know, engaging those eye muscles can be helpful. We think of, you know, imagine kind of taking a picture and someone says cheese, and then they're fumbling with the camera. You know, after a period of time, we kind of get like irritated or whatever. And we're like, oh my gosh, just take the picture, right? <laughs> and at, at, at one point, our smile may feel slightly fake. And part of that is because the eye muscles have vision. It's engaged, right? And when that happens, others can start to sense it, but they can't maybe quite pinpoint that, that smile feels kind of fake, but I can't quite put my finger on why it feels fake. And it's because you know, humans by default are are a frail creature um, when it comes to, you know, we don't have claws, we don't have these, you know, a tough skin and, you know, 
you know, fangs and all this other kind of stuff. So our survival was really based on communication and, and facial expressions and body language is so important to that. And so, you know, just that real subtleness of those micro expressions are a pivotal um, part of it. So it's looking at how do I support that. So this is a really helpful skill with that. Right. And I, one more point to make about it though, is that, you know, it, it's, it's about primarily about social signaling to the other person, but also doing the act of this can help relax yourself and tell your own brain that it's okay. There's no. Yeah. Cause we tend to do this type of body language when we're in comfortable situations with mm -hmm. friends and family that we trust when we're in a place where we feel safe and comfortable. So if we're doing this, even when we're in an environment where we're maybe not necessarily feeling that, what if we're practicing this skill, we're telling our body, hey, I'm in a place where I can feel safe and open. Um, we start to support some of that um, openness. Yeah. All right, this should look familiar to people, although the words on it might not. Um, I think most people are probably uh, have seen this in BBP with um, you know, the different states of mind. Um, but uh, there's also a states of mind in RODBT. They're just a little different. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the ones on the sides, um, the first one is fixed mind. So when we're in fixed mind, uh, the thought is, I don't need to change because I'm right. And all of these states of mind um, arise uh, when, we're, when we're given feedback, um, whether that's from another person, whether that's from the environment, internal feedback, what have you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the person in fixed mind gets the feedback and they think, I don't need to make a change. I'm right. I'm right in the situation. I don't care what you tell me. Um, fatalistic mind, uh, the response to the feedback is, I don't need to change because it's hopeless. There's nothing I can do about it. it why even bother to try? Uh, and I'm sure we can all um, identify uh, probably both of those within ourselves and within patients that we work. Um, flexible mind is the syn synthesis of the two, um, where you know we are we open ourselves to the information, to the feedback, take it in, fairly evaluate it, and decide whether change is necessary. Um, so it doesn't always mean, you know, acquiescing to the situation um, or always changing, taking the suggested feedback. It means that we have opened ourselves up to it um, and have decided whether it's good feedback or not so good feedback um, and then acting accordingly. And the next uh, couple of things we're going to go into, we're going to go into uh, three different skills, RODBT skills that we've found particularly helpful in our practice and um, two of them are just directly have to do with taking feedback. Uh, taking feedback and uh, if you decide that it's good feedback, how do you uh, make a change and incorporate it into your life? Yeah. Another way too to think about the states of mind is fixed mind is imagine the captain of the Titanic learning of, you know, potential icebergs ahead or it being dark and just being like, no, that's fine. I'm just going to keep going this direction. Um, full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. <laughs> The fatalistic mind, we've hit the iceberg and we're going down. You know what? I'm just going to lock myself in the bridge. Why bother even putting out the, uh, the, the lifeboats? We're just going to take anyways. And that flexible mind is receiving the information of potential dangers ahead and assessing how do I want to potentially increase speed and impact. So that's another way to think about it as well. So flexible mind death or definitely um, is, is a key kind of cornerstone when we think about um, what's known as um, my notes here on this. Ah, here we go. Um, what's known um, as self-inquiry. Um, and self-inquiry is um, a distress tolerance skill looking at, you know, how do I learn something that's potentially painful in order to grow and create more openness. So it's acknowledging um, something that's distressful or an unwanted emotion. So this could be things like anxiety, tension in my body, um, or a sensation of numbness that I'm experiencing. And then using that self-inquiry to learn. And self-inquiry is the question kind of like, what do I need to learn? From this experience. So it's a, it's a type of distress tolerance in which there's intention and attention um, to the learning and creating openness. Right? And so that can be used with um, your provider. 
through kind of um, talking back and forth. But many times we also, you know, encourage our clients to have a self inquiry journal in which they set aside a period of time to kind of journal about these different types of things that they're ruminating on and to practice, you know, just kind of intentionally approaching this, you know, uncomfortable topic, you know, where they're kind of digging deep into it in order to learn, um, you know, or find their edge as I guess RO talks about it. Um, and it's not about finding an answer. It's more about just kind of being able to sit with the discomfort of the unknown, um, which then allows us to more flexibility, it flexibly respond with humility of like, you know, what can I learn from this? How does it allow me to, to grow, um, you know, create more just kind of um, openness about, you know, where I'm at, what I, you know, where others are at. Um, and allow me to be less rigid in, in how I'm approaching my relationships and um, my skills and all of that. So it, it's a nice kind of cornerstone in order to help um, dec decrease the stress. And it's a nice way of encouraging growth because um, it allows kind of the ownership of you approaching um, something uncomfortable rather than it just kind of happening. Uh, it's a different way of thinking about distress tolerance skills. Right, yeah, our over-controlled patients, uh, for the most part, will do anything to avoid distress. They will mm -hmm. distract, 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 distract. They do not want to approach it. So, so yeah, like a different kind of distress tolerance, helping them approach the distress rather than just push it down and push it down. Yeah, and by having, you know, kind of a set time limit on that, that self-inquiry, whether they do it individually or with you in a session, um, really helps limit the um, rumination. It really helps support them feeling kind of in charge of when it happens and, and how, um, how they experience that discomfort rather than it just, you know, kind of coming out of the blue for them. And then it allows them to kind of, you know, expand on that, that growth for them. All right, next skill is the ADOPT skill. And, and you're gonna notice a theme in these skills. Mm -hmm. RODBT loves acronyms, just like traditional DBT. Um, so uh, we'll be uh, teaching you the acronym for ADOPTS. Um, but over controls struggle with being open to critical feedback from others, like we talked about in the states of mind. Fixed mind says, I don't need to be open because they're wrong and I'm right. Fatalistic mind, even if I were open, it wouldn't matter because there's nothing I can do. So the ADOPT skill helps people prepare to be open to feedback, both mentally and physically, and decide whether feedback is valid and whether to accept the, the two goals. So what do the actual acronym mean? Um, so the A is acknowledge that feedback is occurring. Um, you know. A lot of our over-controlled uh, patients, clients, are really shut down to their emotions. They, they just are not in touch with it. They might be extremely angry and they have no idea. Um, they, they, it's just so buried. Um, so acknowledging you know, that feedback is even occurring, um, you know, whether, again, internal feedback in the form of emotions, feedback from the environment, feedback from other people, um, just even taking that step that acknowledging that it's happening can be hard. Yeah. So that's step one. Uh, the D is describe and observe emotions, body sensations, and thoughts. Again, another thing that can be really difficult for people who are over controlled. Um, so it's good to practice this. Uh, the O is open to new information by cheerleading and fully listening. So, um, you know, uh, one of the things that goes under the O category is that big three plus one skill of physically opening yourself to the feedback and then fully listening, committing to listening to what the person is saying from beginning to end and not, you know, mentally tuning out, um, you know, not going into your mind and saying, nope, 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 the whole time that they're <laughs> talking. Uh, you know, just staying, you know, being able to kind of stay engaged and stay present with the conversation. Um, P is pinpoint what the new behavior is being recommended by the feedback. So if you have been fully listening, um, you're going to be able to do this one much better. So you want to, um, you know, figure out what the, what the feedback is actually suggesting. What is the person uh, telling you that they want? 
um, that they want you to do. And then, you know, using those active listening skills while repeating it back, you know. So what I hear you saying is that you would like me to blank. Um, and again, until, you know, kind of that back and forth, until you get it right. Uh, then uh, there's kind of a step between P and T where you go through an evaluation of whether or not the, um, it's good feedback or not, whether or not you should make the change. Um, and I we don't have time to go into all of that, but there's an actual worksheet that has 12 yes or no questions that one can go through to figure out whether or not you should try out the new behavior or not. And as an over control, I like really clear things like that. You know, there's, there's a little scoring guide on the back of the worksheet that says if it's over so many yeses, then you definitely should try it out. Um, and so on and so forth. So that's in between the P and the T. Um, and, and that worksheet is in the ROTBT manual. Okay, so if we get to that point where we decide that it's good feedback, probably something we should do, uh, we try out the new behavior. Um, and then self S is self-soothe and reward yourself for being open and trying something new, even if it didn't go that well. Um, so uh, the next skill is the very skill and um, this is basically how you try out the new behavior. Yeah, so you know when we try out something new there's an element of spontaneity and novelness to it, right? So once a patient is able to be open to that new feedback and identifying that many times we can struggle in engaging in a new behavior. So um, you know and I think for many individuals who do experience over control as their you know, and so we oftentimes do like worry about like how are others going to perceive me or you know will I be good at this new behavior and perfectionism if you're a failure can come into play for some of these individuals so the flexible mind varies skill identifies steps that can um, be used to help initiate and evaluate you know the outcomes of engaging in this new and novel behavior so the varies is looking at visualizing the new behavior um, prior to um, engaging it and describing, you know, emotions, thoughts, and sensations that can occur um, when when you're engaging in it. So kind of kind of like the pregame, you know. Um, the A is checking the accuracy of it, maybe any hesitation, aversion, or avoidance that you may be experiencing about engaging in that new behavior. You know, so asking yourself some of those types of questions are like, what are my expectations or predictions of what could maybe happen if I try out this new behavior? So noticing like, you know, you know what, what could be my hesitation? You know, am I experiencing some stress or am I worried that I'm gonna fail or not be good at it or um, that kind of thing of, you know, really allowing, and that's kind of that self-inquiry. What, what's happening for me that's creating that hesitation? Um, the R looks at relinquishing compulsive planning, rehearsal, or preparation, right? So um, sometimes it can be helpful to plan or prepare for certain interactions, right? We can all think about, there are obviously gonna be some things where it makes sense to prepare, and there's other things where it doesn't, right? So maybe, you know, you know, practicing some interview questions for a new job, that could be a good time to practice some preparation or planning. Um, practicing conversation topics for a party on a Friday night, mm, maybe not, right? Could, could that be masquerading as potential avoidance that could mm -hmm. eventually kind of freak us out and create some anxiety that we then end up having? Right? So it's allowing that curiosity of, what is that um, preparation or planning um, kind of doing, right? Um, the I is looking at activating one's social safety, so big three plus one type of stuff, um, and then initiating the new behavior. So the goal is always looking at like, how do I get to that sense of feeling safe, comfortable, um, and in a, kind of in a more calm place in order to activate that behavior. Um, and then that last part is af after the, the behavior has been engaged in, um, kind of evaluating the outcomes in a non-judgmental way, right? So exploring kind of, how did it go? What was, what was helpful? What was unhelpful? Um, do I want to do this behavior again? Do I not? You know, do I want it to be different? What would that look like, right? Um, so, 
yeah so that's, yeah. those are those are the skills and so that brings us uh to the end of what we had formally prepared for you guys mm -hmm. um and carmen is going to uh give us some questions i guess i think that's what's gonna happen yeah yeah <laughs> so we're, we're open for questions so please send them in the question and answer box i have one question that was sent about the externalizing and internalizing mm -hmm. disorders what mm -hmm. is externalizing and internalizing disorders could you talk to that Right, externalizing disorders um, tend to uh, affect, I guess, other people more. You know, they tend to be kids who have behavioral problems are very um, expressive. Uh, you know, you tend to, yeah, just more behavior problems. You know, somebody who has maybe antisocial personality disorder, very externalizing, it's affecting um, mostly affecting their environment, the things around them, you know, and, and internalizing is the opposite of where they're, they're taking it out on themselves. They're the one being, uh, being punished. Um, a lot of times, uh, depression, I would think of as an internalizing disorder, not always, um, you know, anorexia, the, you know, those types of disorders that tend to harm the person more than anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Um, we have had a number of questions about uh, availability of the slides and we will share the slides mm -hmm. uh, with AED so that could be downloaded potentially um, from their website. The, the um, audio tape of this, or actually the video, uh, will be available tomorrow, I believe, um, per AED. So you'll be able to come back to the website and be able to watch it at your leisure. So any other questions for our speakers today? Um, is DBT is DBT structured similar? Uh, sorry, is RODBT structured similar to DBT in that it requires individual group and maybe phone consult? Um, yes. Yes. Um, although, so definitely individual and group. So uh, in an adherent program, it would be um, an individual therapy session every week, and then a two and a half hour. Group. Um, here at Melrose, uh, we actually don't run a two and a half hour group. There's a lot of reasons for that. So we um, do have a one, you know, one hour of group a week. But yeah, if you were an adherent program, you would have uh, both of those components. Um, phone consultation, yes, although our um, over controlled patients tend to not utilize it very much. <laughs> not, certainly not as much as under controlled uh, individuals do. And it's also 30 weeks similar to DBT. Mm -hmm. And so there are mindfulness modules similar to DBT as well. And then those various kind of distress tolerance. That's a cool. Here's another question. How do you conceptualize individuals who have a comorbid diagnosis of an eating disorder and borderline personality disorder? Are they good candidates for DBT, RODBT, or both? Um, so um, one of the resources um, that Dr. Lynch provided is um, a word matching sheet um, in which, you know, if there's, if there's clients where they're, we're not 100% kind of sure where they may lie, um, we'll utilize that, that tool to kind of assess um, kind of which camp they may lie in if they're more over controlled or under controlled. And that will help kind of gear us more towards, you know, if DBT or RODBT would be a better fit for them um, because it helps kind of notice kind of where their tendencies may be if they um, lean one way or the other. Right. Um, however, I would say if somebody has a, a is accurately diagnosed with borderline personality mm -hmm. disorder, uh, much more often than not, they're going to be helped much more by traditional DBT. Um, however, I've had um, patients who I feel have been incorrectly diagnosed with borderline personality disorder because they have been self-harming. Um, and like we talked about earlier in the presentation, you can, you know, you can be over-controlled and self-harm and it can look the same outwardly, but internally it's a lot different process. Um, so those people, again, much better helped by radically open DBT. So if somebody has an accurate diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, probably traditional DBT is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So if you suspect that a, a client is over-controlled, however, uh, when they relapse into eating disorder, substance, and or trying to work through trauma, um, the patient ramps up and mm -hmm. is more impulsive and has more risky behaviors. What are your thoughts about that, um, that type of 
waffling back and forth. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's tough. Yeah. And I think it just, you know, I think you kind of have to use your judgment from knowing the person, mm -hmm. you know, what, what would better help them. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you've known them for a long time and you know them to be very over controlled, um, you know, and, and they're just kind of, I don't know how to say it in like a, in a helpful way, but you know, that they, they look more impulsive as they ramp up, you know, you probably would still want to refer them to RODBT, um, but otherwise uh, traditional DBT. Um, I, I just, you know, again, just wanting to emphasize that the behavior can look the same. Um, the example I always give in my groups is, um, you know, you've got uh, somebody who is under controlled, who starts a new job, they get there and their cube mates, day one, chewing gum really loud. Um, somebody who is under controlled is gonna whack them with the stapler day one. The person is not going to have to wonder why they did that. Um, and over control would start that same job and they would sit there with the annoying gum chewing person for a year and then the person, you know, one day asked them to borrow a pencil and they whack them over the head with the stapler. The person has no idea why that happened. It looks impulsive, um, but it's actually not impulsive. It's been building up over time. Yeah. And, and some skills in both DBT and RO can complement mm -hmm. if, if a client is doing the other protocol. Yeah. So I do have some clients who are, um, do have borderline and they are in a uh, DBT program and Occasionally, I will kind of cherry pick one or two, you know, mm -hmm. skills that are RO that will complement really well the kind of what they are doing um, because of how their eating disorder is manifesting mm -hmm. for them and vice versa, right? You know, somebody's doing RO DBT protocol and there's just certain DBT skills that just really complement where they're at in their recovery. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's that really nice thing about it being, being able to kind of meet the client with Right, and I think that it just also kind of highlights the point. Uh, clients are complicated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's nice to be able to say, yep, this is the treatment for this person, and if we do it completely adherently, it would 100% work, but, you know, clients are complicated, so sometimes you got to mix it up. I think, um, considering the time, we probably have time for one more, maybe two more questions. One of the questions is about outcomes and responsiveness that you've seen clinically and if there's any evidence in the literature for um, positive outcomes using RODBT for the mm -hmm. types of, of folks that would benefit from it. Right, so I can't, I cannot cite this off the top of my head, but on the, the website that you guys are seeing right now, radicallyopen.net, there is a section that has a lot of good uh, research literature about that and there is at least one study that relates to eating disorders on there. Yeah, and um, in Europe and in um, specifically in the UK, um, Dr. Lynch's team, and they've been doing research for almost 30 years on this. And it's, you know, so there's, there's plenty of research out there and, and they list a lot of the different things. As well, so there's a lot of different kind of um, things to, to look to. Um, I know it's, it's, radically new here in the U.S., but it, it in a way, it's it's kind of old news in other places in the world, um, and so it's, I know it's just kind of coming to our shores, but um, it, it's definitely a wonderful tool in other places, and they have some wonderful resources that you guys can look to um, that have been really helpful, um, and there are definitely trainings that are coming up kind of all over the place, um, and the team there is fantastic. Um, and, and definitely for me, working with clients, I do um, some of the groups here um, and working with individual pa patients, definitely noticing an increase in flexibility as they challenge some of their rigid thinking right. patterns and helping support them in their eating disorder recovery. And I also just anecdotally, what I hear a lot um, when I talk with uh, people who are over controlled about RODBT and about um, the groups and things that they've never heard about it before is that. Um, you know, once you go through it all, they feel, they feel understood, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a way that they hadn't felt understood before, um, you know, being sent to traditional DBT. Um, so, you know, and I think that just facilitates change in and of itself, you know, they feel understood, they feel like you know where they're coming from. Um, and again, that seems a lot of good outcome just from that. Great. Well, we're at the full 60 minutes, and we just want to thank you again for participating in today's webinar. 
thank you to Allison and Sarah for, for your great, fantastic <laughs> presentation. Um, and we just, again, appreciate you all participating. Uh, the the uh, video will be on the website available tomorrow, and we will be making those slide, the slide deck available to you. So thanks, everyone, and have a great day.